Good, good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to uh, moderate the final panel where we're going to focus on combating disinformation, uh, counter-programming, inoculation, education, and community. Not only is this the, the final panel, I, I think it's probably the most, most challenging, as, as Alan alluded to, given the discussions today and, and, and yesterday. So to help address this, I have uh, five leading experts in the area, and I'm going to briefly introduce them, and then I'll turn it over to them. So we have uh, UC. Um, my notes. Um, it serves as the head of communications at the National Cybersecurity of Finnish Transportation and Communications Agency. Andrea, senior analyst at the Swedish Psychological Defense Agency and the lead for the agency's digital hub analysis section encompassing social media, gaming, AI, and cyber. Steve uh, is a cognitive scientist with an interest in computational modeling at the University of Bristol. Brahm is a CEO of and senior marketing manager of DROG. And uh, Sander, who's already been introduced, of course, is the professor of, of social psychology at the University of Cambridge. And before I begin, I'm going to make a short plug. He didn't ask me, but, but, but uh, uh, Sander has a, has a great book that actually I, I read a couple months ago. But uh, if you're interested in this area, it's, it's really about this topic. So please check it out. Foolproof. Uh, congratulations as well. So. Um, we're going to pivot a little bit. We've, we've talked about combating actually throughout the last couple of days, so I would actually like to start by giving each panelist seven to ten minutes to explain their connection and approach to combating disinformation. And in particular, something to think about as they're doing that, and maybe they can help answer, is what does success look like? We'll start with there, and then, and then we'll, we'll have some further questions. So I'm going to start with Andrea, if you would please start us off. So, Hello. What does success look like? No pressure. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Um, so I am a senior analyst with the Swedish Psychological Defense Agency. And um, yeah, so what is psychological defense? It's usually something that's a bit sort of fuzzy. People don't understand what that is, which I uh, also am not surprised over for sure. Uh, psychological defense is a concept in Sweden started in the 50s. And so not to get into too much history, but um, in around 2014, uh, with the annexation of Crimea, uh, there was a small group of people that got the task with the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency at the time to um, start analyze, identify, analyze, and, and also support actors in the Swedish system to counter what uh, we know now as disinformation. But we say malign information influence directed towards Sweden by foreign actors. Um, fast forward 2018, uh, then the Swedish Prime Minister said, we've now come that, as far now that we will um, try to open an, an agency that will focus only on this. And in 2022, January 1st, the Swedish Psychological Defense Agency opened its doors. And we are called the Psychological Defense Agency, but we're actually not the Psychological Defense of Sweden. It is our population that is the Psychological Defense. All of you, wherever you belong, you're the Psychological Defense. And um, what's important to remember is that we are a civil defense capacity. We report to the Ministry of Defense, which means that we only look at and monitor um, threat actors and non-state actors, state actors, ideologically motivated actors targeting any type of malign information influence towards Sweden, so from abroad. We do not look at our internal space at all. It's not actor-specific. We're very careful um, about doing that, of course. And what we do, however, when it comes to our domestic space, we look at vulnerabilities. So, um, and I'm um, also the lead for our digital hub, which um, Brad was saying encompasses social media, AI, uh, cyber, not cybersecurity, but the cyber domain where it overlaps with information influence, and also gaming platforms, so any, any type of digital platforms. And those platforms are sort of um, often an, a, a gate when it comes to um, vulnerabilities in connection with our population. So that would be an example of areas of vulnerabilities where we do risk assessments, vulnerability assessments, consequences of that, and then we produce from our operational department, we produce situational reports uh, to a variety of actors in Sweden, and one of our primary tasks is to coordinate 
all of the actors in Sweden within our mandate. And so we provide all of our knowledge when it comes to threats, vulnerabilities and consequences um, to relevant actors and to our employer, of course, the government. And, um, and then we also, as part of our operational toolkit, so to speak, we, um, um, we work with quite strategically with strategic communications efforts. Uh, and then we also have a capacity building department where we um, conduct trainings, um, we reach out to civil society, and we provide support to youth organizations, um, to news media. They are completely, of course, independent um, uh, actor in Sweden, so when they turn to us, we give support. Um, so this is important as part of our work. But when it comes to the strategic communications aspects, which I will, I will just finish up by giving you an example. Um, Sweden, when we opened our doors, we were targeted by a malign information influence campaign uh, by um, ideologically motivated actors, by Islamist actors. This was last year, 2022 in January, it's when we identified the campaign and uh, we, um, just a few days later, we went out and we started talking about it because we could attribute, which is important. It's the only way you can actually openly talk about how a campaign looks like, how it targets vulnerable target groups, um, and in Sweden, Muslim target groups, uh, for example. Um, and um, also, in February, Russia invaded Ukraine, and then we had our own elections in September. This was all going on in 2022. So we were, by just being as new as we were, um, although we had worked with these issues, as I mentioned, at a previous agency, we were just transferred over a few of us. Um, we were thinking, okay, how can we reach a general population quite quickly and to sort of make ourselves known um, this is who we are, and this is our mission, and this is what we're tasked to do. So we launched um, a, an information campaign called Don't Be Fooled. And the information campaign was all about media literacy. It was basically about sort of source criticism and how to consider all of the different pitfalls that you can end up with in, in all of the information that you're receiving from many different platforms, many different sources, because that's where, that's where we are today. We all have technology and we can be completely overwhelmed without even thinking about it because we're used to it. Don't be fooled. We considered the name. Nobody really wants to be fooled, right? And also our intention there was not to cause any worry. So what we wanted to do with that was just focusing on source criticism, as I mentioned. And we used different techniques and methods in um, how to present the campaign in itself. We had all from billboards to social media, we went out on TV, we used influencers in Sweden. They were magicians and they made videos and they were tricking people, so it was kind of like a, a bit of a game around it as well, and all of these videos were spreading um, in social media as well. And it, 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 it gave quite a lot of, um, um, it got good, good, we received very good feedback, that's what I want to say. And um, it became well known in Sweden. And this, and it, it sort of is a way to encourage a population to think critically and also to build resilience. That's the whole purpose of our work is to um, encourage the Swedish population uh, to um, understand also that they need to be resilient. And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. You see, would you? Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Um, please raise your hand if you hand profile in one of the social media platforms. Okay, uh, next, uh, raise your hand if you read the terms of use when you opened your profile. Terms of use. Uh, oh. yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> A good exercise. <laughs> I remember once I, asked, I usually ask the same question, and I had a presentation in Finland, and I always ask the same question. And in one, one event, there was just one hand rising up, and uh, maybe the person noticed that uh, he, he, he was the only one, and he didn't cause any, wanted to cause any fuss, so the hand disappeared very, very fast. Yes, I, I, I'm usually, as I said, Finnish names are a little bit complicated. I'm, uh, nowadays, I'm working as a head of communication at the National Cybersecurity Center, and... 
I, I started working with these uh, issues. It was 2014, 2015. I was in Sweden, and after the Ru Russia invaded Ukraine, the Ill illegal annexation of Crimea, then it was obvious that we needed to do in the Finnish government, uh, government communications in a more coordinated manner. So then the Prime Minister's office started coordinating the activities, and I was the co kind of coordinating expert in the Prime Minister's office. But it usually we think that the this information is quite a new phenomenon, but still, if, if I look back in our history, so first clear cases in Finland, we already saw uh, Russian campaigns targeting in Finland over 10 or 15 years ago. In Kremlin media starting spreading stories about how Russia is hunt, uh, how Finland, Finnish authorities, social workers are hunting Russian-born children and taking them into custody without any valid reason and selling them to U.S. gay couples. And, how, and there were stories of how much money Finnish civil servants earn by doing this. And of course, then uh, Finnish, uh, Finland is a small nation, 5.6 million people living. And in Finland, government agencies are very independent. And the Prime Minister's Office is one of the 12 ministries. And Prime Minister's Office has a coordinating role in many, many issues. So then it was decided that when, when we started looking at that, uh, that there are clearly information campaigns targeting uh, our society that we need to do more in a, a coordinated way, as I said. And what we did then was that we started training our civil servants, and of course in the beginning, in 2014-2015, we, we, we started looking at who could provide us training. And then we tra my colleagues traveled around, met researchers, and visited research institutes, think tanks, and we found tra experts from Harvard University, who, uh, and, and they collected a bunch of experts, for example from MIT, and they traveled in 2016 to Finland, and 100 civil servants were trained, trained at the time. And of course, in some pro-Kremlin circles, it was labeled that 100 CIA agents came to Finland to train civil servants. But of course, they were, uh, they were scholars who came. And the aim was to train the trainers, so that we don't have a specific agency uh, dealing with these issues, uh, as in Sweden, instead that we are following kind of the con Finnish concept of comprehensive security, kind of as the whole society is targeted, it's every single one's duty to defend our, our society. It's not only a military issue, next day Finnish agricultural projects could be targeted, then it's Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry who, takes the, who is in charge and the others are supporting. And since 2016, that was, uh, we conducted our first training, and since then we have trained and briefed more than 10,000 civil servants, and, stu and we have visited universities, etc. And I'm especially happy that uh, my Swedish colleague is sitting next to me, because we have, have always extremely good collaboration with Sweden. Sweden. Even though we have lost in ice, ho ice hockey games now and then, but still. <laughs> and a good example of that was that uh, from the very beginning we started collaborating with our Swedish colleagues. And a Swedish uh, civil contingency agencies, MSB, published in 2018, was it an excellent handbook on countering information influence activities. It's an excellent handbook. And of course, we, Finns, we were jealous, had damn, the Swedes did it. But then, <laughs> damn, but then we decided that uh, it would be great if our Swedish colleagues would allow us to translate the handbook in Finnish. And we contacted our Swedish colleagues and they said, we are happy if, you could, if we would do that. And then we did it. And then, of course, because we have two official languages in, in Finland, Sweden and Finnish, so we published a li little bit edited version of that Swedish handbook in Finnish. Uh, also in Finnish, Swedish. So now there is two Swedish versions of that handbook circulating. <laughs> uh, on, not, not to be uh, any, not to make things any complicated, but there is a 2.0 coming out. Yeah, so yeah. from Sweden, thought, so you'll yeah. You'll and I, 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 uh, I, a little while ago, I checked that it's one of the downloaded publications of the Finnish government ever. So it, it holds a position number six. So we're extremely thankful uh, our Swedish colleagues. And uh, that, that's one thing we are in the government are doing. But the most important thing that. Uh, the CNN published a couple of years a news story, and I was one of the experts interviewed in that news story, and the title was that Finland is winning the war on fake news and what other countries can learn from Finland. I am saying that, of course, the title is great, but still, I don't see that we are winning any war. This information has been a problem 100 years ago, 200 years ago. It's a problem today. It's also being a problem tomorrow and 10 years ago. 100 years or in the future. So there is no day, exact date we can say that this is over. 
And uh, one of the things that uh, Finland has been named is that our society is very resilient to disinformation or any other forms of malign information influence activities. And I think that's because of the very basic structure and nature of our society. Uh, Finland is doing very well in different kind of rank global rankings. We have excellent school system. Media literacy has been part of our school, official school cur curricula since the 1970s. It already starts in kindergarten, it continues in basic education, it continues in adult education. Seniors also, they have own targeted programs. Even our defense forces, for, we have a conscription army. So a lot of men and women go through every year the military service. So media literacy also taught in, in the, as part of the conscription. So that's, uh, that's one thing. But still, uh, we need, we, and we need to collaborate in this issue. There's no one wins this alone. And I think when I first attended the first Stratcom uh, summit and events and, and disinformation events in 2015 and 2016, the audience consisted mainly on civil servants. Civil, civil servants discussed with civil servants. Of course, that was good. And nice. it's always nice to meet other civil servants. But, uh, but still, I think it, it twisted focus as... As I said, that the whole society is targeted, and more, 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 so more research is needed, and more comprehensive approach is needed. And uh, I think that's pretty much. I'm known in Finland that uh, I'm a man who, who speaks, <laughs> inhales, and exhale, exhales simultaneously. <laughs> you do. So I think <laughs> I you. will now shut my mouth and give the floor to others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yussi. I'm going to turn to Steve next. Thanks. Yeah, I. Uh, <clears throat> I moved to Bristol from Australia uh, 10 years ago, and, and a short time after I arrived, the um, vice chancellor introduced me to colleagues at a cocktail party by saying, oh, this is Steve. He's our local controversialist. <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh, I'm off to a good start. <laughs> now, all is well. He's gone. I'm still around. Uh, but I, I do have to start out by making uh, three points to place the quest for solutions into, into a context that I think is very important and perhaps controversial. So the first point I want to make is that whatever we have done up here and do up here is, is you know, great stuff, but it is insufficient to solve the problem. Um, inoculation, debunking, dealing with misinformation, teaching people is all terrific, but it's not going to overcome the deep structural problems that are the cause of this malaise. And one of them is, is the attention economy, which a lot of people have alluded to already yesterday and today. Human attention, we know, is biased towards negativity and things that outrage us and stir up anger. Well, if you have a machine called Facebook or any, you know, YouTube or whatever that, that is uh, making money from keeping your attention on the platform, then obviously, what are they going to do? They're going to feed you stuff that makes you outraged and angry because it translates into more money. Now, it's a bit more nuanced than that, but I, I, I think we have a structural problem there that inoculation cannot resolve. We don't have a silver bullet. We may have sort of bronze pellets of buckshot or something that we can throw at the problem as behavioral scientists. Now, the second point is uh, that there is a striking strong asymmetry, political asymmetry, in the source of misinformation. And that's the elephant in the room, and I don't think we should ignore it. There is so much data out there now showing that in the United States, at least, the production, sharing, consumption of misinformation is vastly greater on the political right than it is on the political left. Uh, we published a paper a few months ago where we looked at tweets by Congress, members of Congress for the last six years, and the asymmetry is absolutely startling if you compare the quality of news sources shared by Republicans versus Democrats. Republicans are, you know, vastly more likely to share um, disinformation. And, of course, one of the biggest... Uh, 
sources of disinformation was Donald Trump during his presidency. Uh, we all know that, or at least the reality-based community presumably knows that. Um, but here's the other thing. Among Republicans, three quarters consider Donald Trump to be honest all the way through his presidency. Now, how can that be? How can a serial misinformer be honest? Well, that brings me to my third point. And the third point is one of democratic backsliding. Now, we have observed democratic backsliding for, you know, between, you know, 5, 10, 15 years. There, there are at least three institutions in the world who are dealing with this. There is The Economist. There's something called VDEM in, in Sweden. Uh, and then there is something called Freedom House. And they all agree, however they analyze the data, that there is this democratic uh, backsliding. And it is particularly pronounced in the United States, uh, less so in the United Kingdom. And so why is that? Well, the way I would like to put it is that there used to be a very solid boundary between democratic conservatism and authoritarian forms of government, you know, populism, fascism, and that wall has been crumbling. There is, in my opinion, very little doubt about that if you consider all the unspeakable things that have happened in the United States and the United Kingdom. In the UK, Parliament was illegally shut down by a rogue government a few years ago. Now, you wouldn't know that because the media, of course, much of the media reframed that as um, left-wing judges thwarting the will of the people, which is very reminiscent of the original German from the 1930s. In the US, we've had a violent insurrection of the capital, which has been reframed by uh, elements of the Republican Party, not all of them, but elements, strong elements, as some sort of spontaneous outburst of adventure tourism or something. You know, it, it was uh, completely normalized. So we're now confronted with what I personally think is a, is a fairly critical situation, um, and there's a lot of data to, to support that. Now, how does that tie into misinformation and, and what to do about it? Well, I think the way it ties into misinformation is by considering this conundrum of Donald Trump being considered honest. How is that possible? Well, I think it is possible if you have a different way of conceptualizing truth. If you conceptualize truth as being an expression of authentic belief, then, yeah, Donald Trump is incredibly honest. There was never any doubt when he was on Twitter about how he felt. He was authentically expressing his belief in the moment. And that is perfectly fine. It is one aspect of honesty. But, of course, if that is the only thing that is, is, is left, and evidence and veracity no longer matters, then you have a very problematic situation because then it is, you know, you can't even agree on what the different parties are disagreeing on. And in support of that, we have a paper forthcoming where we um, contrasted these different conceptions of honesty, one that we call belief speaking, which is this authentic expression of how you feel on the one hand, and what we call fact speaking, which is not considering your feelings, but considering the evidence that is in front of us. We, we're able to identify these two different approaches to truth in political communications in the United States. And what we find is that authentic belief speaking among Republicans is associated with the sharing of misinformation as measured through NewsGuard. Whereas for Democrats, that's not the case. Now, the other thing we find, and this is good news, is that Republicans and Democrats don't differ much when Republicans are engaging in fact speaking. So they're totally capable of that. And whenever they do, then, you know, they're sharing accurate information. 
And the other piece of evidence relating to this is a series of papers we published a couple of years ago with Brian E. Swire as first author, where we showed that Republican voters are actually sensitive to corrections of falsehoods presented by Donald Trump. Um, if we tell them, oh, by the way, you know, this was wrong, then they say, oh, okay, I won't believe it as much. However, it made no dent to how they felt about Donald Trump and their support for Donald Trump. So the reason I think this is important to understand is because we're confronted with a situation where for some people, genuinely, evidence is now far less important than uh, authentic, sincere expression of belief, no matter how distorted that belief might be from reality. So how, how do we move on from that if, if you're confronted with this different uh, conception of honesty? Well, this is where we get back to my first point. There's no silver bullet, but there are some encouraging signs, I think, uh, in this space. And one of them is, and this is work with Sander, which I'm sure he can expand on later, one of them is in the arena of inoculation where we can teach people through brief videos to be on the lookout for markers of disinformation, including, and I think this is important, including emotional signals that tend to be associated with, with misinformation, and it is tapping into that sort of emotional component of, of misinformation that, that I think is particularly important. And we can show that people can learn how to discern uh, uh, misinformation from true information in that manner, and that is true across the political spectrum, more or less. And we've also recently, we got some further work in, uh, in the pipeline where we show that um, we can encourage people to be less polarized. Um, and we've done this using Brexit as the hot button trigger issue here in the UK, and we've done it with Roe v. Wade uh, in the United States, really seriously hot button issues. And we're able to show that if you present people with a video that reminds them of, of the common, you know, things they have in common with the opposing political side, and if you say, don't fall for the hate pushers, um, then there's a measurable impact on how people feel and how uh, a reduced likelihood in sharing polarizing information and so on. So uh, there are tools, there are signs of hope, uh, absolutely, no question. Uh, but I think we do have to recognize that the context in which we operate is very challenging. Thank you, Steve. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Ron. Uh, see, my job, you can see from my attire that I'm a tech guy. Uh, it's, it's, if it's go-to solution, you have to like working type jeans and, and, and hoodies uh, to make it all happen, right? So this is what I do. I'm a tech transfer guy, meaning uh, I suck the... This is a nice Harry Potter Dementor style. I can do this. <laughs> I suck the scientists dr from their best ideas and build that into a product and take that product and build it into a business and then sell on that business to get money so I can do some more dementoring and make new stuff. So if you say, well, uh, for instance, uh, we are the most uh, successful outfit in Europe doing that. I would say the whole world, but I'm not completely sure. I am pretty sure about Europe because we're the only ones. So there you <laughs> go. it's not hard to be successful if you're the only one. So what we do is try to, for instance, Sander, comes up with an idea, uh, we uh, build that into a game, we see that there's people uh, translating those games, uh, see that it is distributed, actually the editorial work uh, of doing that, and we provide a pipeline with data pre and post testing back to Sander, so he can do 
follow-up studies to see whether we actually move the needle with this intervention. And now I'm all empty. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Idea. And then he writes a book about it and becomes very popular, <laughs> but, I, but I get all the money. That's, 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 the, that's deal, the deal, right? And the reason I get the money is that I'm selling it on to UC and Andrea. We sell it to governments and stuff like that. So whenever Steve comes up with something new that I haven't heard of before, I automatically am translating this into how can I productize this? How can I commoditize this? How can I build this into an intervention that is checkable, that's accountable, that we can sell onto you see and to Andrea. And I'm the only one who gets nothing. <laughs> and at the end of the show, Steve gets nothing. That's, 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 the whole, that's the whole thing. So who's playing the game? Sorry, for you, so you can. Uh, who's playing the game? What, what game? I mean, you said you set up games, right? Oh, uh, well. You, you, you commercial. Oh, that's, a, that's, that's a good one. So the game. Um, uh, actually, Sander has more data on that, so I, I won't speak. But we, our customers are uh, big governments, big NGOs, and they say, could you make a version of that game for us that's more topical, especially uh, the cabinet's office in the UK uh, uh, ordered a version that was specifically uh, made for uh, Antifax which is very easy to do, and it's all based on the whole pre-bunking idea. Uh, we made that a, a special version for them. We have to do that GDPR compliant, we have to do all the, the legwork, the, 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 the judicial stuff, the, the, all the other stuff around it. So I'm, I'm the tech guy, this is, this is what I do. Um, the, and and um, I think, Sander, uh, not to tout your trumpet, but uh, I think it's the most successful intervention in the world right now, still, after five years and running, which is in itself a, a big thing, most successful inter, uh, intervention that's out there. And that says something to, can I do what? Um, and this is the best we can do. The pre-bunking game from Drog. I'm just laying it out here. That's the most successful we have been so far. And it's not enough, and I completely agree with Steve on that one. It's not enough. We are just scratching maybe the surface here. And we can see it makes a difference. We can make some inroads on, we have some data that are promising but it, it, it doesn't move the needle too much. Well, I'm an accountant. Can you give me a number? Can you tell me the effectiveness? Sander speaks to that because he's the guy who was doing the, the real accounting on the, on the end of... Uh, he's cooking the books. He's, <laughs> no. the, the guy who, who gets the, the single neck to choke when, uh, when, when the numbers are not right. Yeah. So, but uh, th that's where we are. Th this is what I do. Uh, take their stuff build it into a product, sell it to them, and get rich in the process, and buy a beer for Steve. Uh, yeah, you Thanks. do get all the beer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hopefully. Sander, do you want to take it from there and add, add what? Add, <laughs> give us yeah, I, I guess so. So I'll, I'll, maybe you're, you're correct, because your question was about the definition of success, right? Yeah. And so maybe you know, it's, it's, it's good to, to try to answer that question from multiple angles, because I think our definitions of success have changed over time. I've become more confused about what, what is success. Um, and in fact, the, the multi-level marketing scheme goes deeper. So, you know, I had an idea, and then John Rosenbeek with the, with the curly hair over there, I'm not, I'm not sure if he's in the, in the room, uh, uh, you know, was like, oh, let's, let's do a game. And then, and then you know, Ruud and, and Bram and Droch, um, um, you know, were instrumental in, in turning this into a real-world enterprise. And you can have many views on, on, on what makes it a success. And so I think for a lot of social media companies and governments that we work with, they, they look at success in terms of how many people have played this game or how many impressions do you get on a campaign. Um, and that is not the typical science definition of what we would consider success, uh, but maybe it is. So I think there's two, two aspects to that that we've learned. 
And um, we've discussed this point a lot, what you see in, in, when we produce things in science, it's often boring. Um, and I don't want to make any <laughs> jokes about accounting. We work with numbers, but so, you know, in science, we work with numbers, obviously, in models, too. And so we think about how, how to make this engaging and, and interesting for people. And, you know, so to some extent, success can be an intervention that people actually want to play. Um, and that, you know, that can be a definition of success because the first challenge is how are you going to get people to interact with whatever solution that you come up with that is voluntary and opt-in? It could be scientifically perfect, but nobody engages with it. Uh, and then you, don't, you have scientific success, but, but that's the only kind of success you have. Um, you can have an intervention that is super interesting and everyone engages with it, but if it totally doesn't work on a scientific level, then, you know, that's also problematic. And so we wanted to be somewhere in between where we translate theories about how to pre-bunk and inoculate people into, into interventions that are both fun and educational, as some people say, you know, ed edutainment. Um, and so uh, what's, been inter what's interesting, though, is because when we started this many years ago, John... And, uh, and others were, were, do, we were doing this in, in school with a paper-based version of the game. I mean, the, the, the original idea was old school. We literally had cards, and you would step into the role of a propagandist by sorting the, you know, a news article according to how a propagandist would do it based on your assigned character, like a clickbait monger or a conspiracy theorist. Um, and so we had a, a wonderful coordinator in, the, in high schools in the Netherlands who helped us run these interventions. And then after a while, John and I realized that uh, after a year's work, we had 90 responses uh, um, you know, from, from the trial, about 100 people. And so we thought, is, was this a success? Uh, and so, you know, it was, it was reviewed, and we got some grumpy comments from, from Steve who said, who said, you know, well, I don't know, about 100 people. Um, and, so, and so, you know, the, 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 question, the, the question became... Um, it was very constructive. Uh, it, it was, yeah, yeah, he didn't have his beer yet. He didn't and his 100 yet. is not much. It, it, was, it, it wasn't much, yeah. And so, and so we said, okay, this was a, a nice pilot study, but what's the, the next level? And so, you know, I think the benefit of, for me, in terms of success is, is working with real-world organizations like, like Droch and, and others that, that can, you know, turn... A uh, scientific project into uh, you know into a real output, and so eventually it became a, an online game, um, um, and um, a fully fledged kind of social media simulation that also allowed other people to do interesting science. So lots of you know we did lots of projects with other researchers where they embed questions in in the intervention pre and post, and we can test different questions. It's dynamic, right? So you can change scenarios, and you can do a lot with it. And so we thought that was successful in terms of maybe innovating a little bit in terms of how we do these kinds of tests and, and, and come up with, with solutions. Um, but then the question from the scientific perspective is, is what is a successful outcome when, when you give people a pre-bunk or you know, a weakened dose of disinformation in a simulator and they become more resilient? What's the right outcome measure? And so you know, scientists uh, talk about this a lot. Is it... Is the goal here, is success to help people spot real news more? Like, do we want people to, to trust real news more? Do we want people to spot fake news more? Do we want to help people recognize manipulation? Or maybe to discern between real news and, and fake news better? And I've come to appreciate that actually all of these require slightly different skills. So, you know, sp helping people spot real news is often about, you know, being a good journalist, checking your sources, doing lateral reading. Uh, there's tons of interventions that promote that, that type of skill. Uh, you know, we focus on helping people spot manipulation, which is also a unique kind of focus because you have to break down the fingerprints as Steve was talking about of manipulation. What cues are associated with manipulative content and can you pre-bunk that? But then discerning between the two, um, you know, requires some sort of feedback and learning of how to differentiate the, the, the two. And so there's different psychological processes involved and you have, can have different kinds of interventions. And, and so what is, what is success? You know, some people say, well, the, the problem is that people don't trust real news. Other people say, well, the problem is really that so many people believe false news. Um, and I think that's where the goal of the intervention matters for our definition of, of success. So is the solution to build trust in credible news, to help people spot manipulative news? Um, I, you know, 
having been through my own intervention lots of times, I don't want to pose any false dichotomies. You know, I think we can, we can do uh, all of that at the same time. But that maybe is what success is to me, that you know, we need to help people spot real news, we have to help people spot fake news, and also discern between the two. Um, and that's all at the individual level. And I don't think pre-bunking is, is necessarily the only thing we need to do. I do think it's a good first line of defense, you know, if we follow the public health analogy. Um, to some extent, you have to have a first line of defense against false information. We know that debunking can sometimes work, but it's challenging, as Steve has shown over the last 30 years or so, right? Memory is tricky. Um, and so what, what we need to do is protect people. But then not pre-bunking is not going to catch everything, right? So we need debunking. I like to think of this as a multi-layer defense system. So we have pre-bunking. And then if that doesn't work, we, we have the best types of debunks that we can come up with. And if that doesn't work, we have real-time uh, uh, fact-checking. And in fact, uh, you would reverse the order, right? So real-time would be real-time fact-checking. Uh, and if that doesn't work, we do debunking after the fact. And you start with pre-bunking. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, a defense system that only works if it's implemented on a wide scale. I mean, we're doing some pre-bunking, but, but it's not integrated into the national curriculum in every country uh, from an early age, right? Uh, not everyone is doing debunking in the most optimal way, and we don't have the resources to fact check everything. Uh, it's not automated yet. Um, and so, you know, if we look at some of our colleagues in Finland who score in the 90th percentile on media literacy, on, on scientific literacy, um, uh, they've been teaching children how to spot propaganda from an early age. And so you could say, I'm not sure if it's based on inoculation, because I think the educators have freedom to, to, to implement the curriculum how, how they see fit, but, but it is pre-bunking in a way because they start very early. Um, and so, you know, I think that's an example of how to systematically do that at the country level. And if, if we all did this in every country, um, maybe we're getting somewhere. Uh, um, and then the last point I'll make is that I totally agree with Steve that even if we empower people the best we can, we still have to change the incentives of the whole system. Um, and, you know, our research shows uh, maybe the accountant will, uh, will, will like this, this aspect. So in some research we've shown that um, when you ask people if this is true or fake and you show people partisan headlines, you know, people, people, you know, people don't differentiate that well. They give answers that are incorrect. And then we tell people, now we're going to pay you a dollar for the correct answer. Uh, and, and then all of a sudden, people know uh, to some extent what the right answer is. Like, oh, maybe this article about re Republicans is true after all. Or maybe this article that wasn't so negative about the Democrats is true after all. But, you know, is paying people to be accurate a scalable <laughs> intervention? Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, we do it all the time. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, the reviewers of our paper were, were pessimistic about this. You know, they were like, go find some other solution. Um, and so... Uh, no, but but, we, we, can, we, we, we at least can now put it... I will bridge to you, Dana. Uh, we at least now can put a number to if we could, say, uh, pay 20 million a year in, in the UK and we would get rid of 90% of all the inaccuracy on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, I guess you uh, that we, At least we can put a number to it. Like, if we want to completely get rid, it costs like two billion. Is that it? Yeah, that's... that's <laughs> two that's two billion is the number. But we're going to quote... The news will be quoting you, Brahm, on the... the, two, I, I, the I, will, I, will, I will take that one. I will, I will take, take that one. If, it, if it's a, this information, it's solvable, it's solvable. Two, billion, two billion, just pay people to be more accurate. Alan will check the numbers on the... Milan was here, he'd take... Oh, he'd give the money. Uh, Steve, you want to you wanna ask? Yeah, I just <clears throat> wanted to, to connect to what Sander was saying and, um, you know, pivot from the game maybe a little to other ways in which sure, yeah, the yeah. skill can be boosted. Um, and I want to connect it back to the discussion earlier today about micro-targeting and how people, you know, are being presented with things that are designed to exploit their vulnerabilities. And um, how can we deal with that? Well, we started tackling this, this problem a few years ago with colleagues at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. And, what we showed was that, to some extent at least, you can reverse engineer micro-targeting. And what we did was the following. We uh, gave people a personality test, very quick, just on the introversion, extroversion scale. Um, we gave them feedback on where they where they were located on this dichotomy. And we then presented them with ads that were targeted at either 
introverts or extroverts. And the task of the participants was to spot when they were being targeted. So an extrovert would have to say, aha, uh -huh, I'm targeted by an extrovert ad, and vice versa yeah. for introverts. And what we found was just giving people feedback on, on who they are boosted their performance by about 20 or 30 percentage points. They went from barely above chance to nearly 90% accurate. Um, so that opens a window, perhaps, to, uh, to be able to, to you know, give people the skills required to detect when they're being manipulated, specifically based on their personality. And we now have a model, a text-based computational model that can identify text, political text, that is consonant with someone's personality. So we, we have windows into the possibility of alerting people even when they're being targeted. But it's early days, but I just wanted to put that out there. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I actually want to ask a question to UC and Andre, and then I want to open up to questions from the audience. We have about 35 minutes. So you both have some you know, long experience in the government communication space, and how has the information environment changed during the years, and how has your government responded to those changes? UC, you want to start? Uh, I remember back in 2009, I was working to finish police, and social media, of course, it was not new, but you know, those different platforms were new. I even had a profile on MySpace, if someone still remembers. <laughs> I also had a profile on Second Life. And it reminds me that, can you, someone tell the difference of a Meta's Metaverse and Second Life? Because for me, it resembles, they're pretty much almost the same, same idea. And I, I remember that when we spoke about social media in 2009 and 2010, we mainly uh, d discussed about its positive sides the way it connects people and what good we can achieve. It opens the government, it allows, gives us new ways, uh, methods and ways to people to communicate with the government. And of course there were still problems, and uh, already problems, and when 2009 Finnish police opened its uh, first pa Facebook profile, it went into headlines in Finland. And I think one journalist called me in and uh, interviewed me in and she said that she had heard a rumor that police is opening a Facebook profile because it was big news. And of course, uh, I, I answered her, her questions, and the, uh, the he, he, when, when she published the news story, the headline was that Finnish uh, police penetrated Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was an oh, oh boy. But still, we already saw problems uh, at that time, but we, we didn't think so much that there could be some coordinated activities. Instead, we saw that there are angry people who are, they are angry for some reasons, and they are posting during later, Sunday, Friday morning hours after a few pints, something, something like that. But soon, I think 2014 was an uh, eye-opener for us. And of course, the government communications has changed quite a lot during that time. Nowadays, we talk more about strategic communications, the importance of uh, strategic communications. And of course, uh, we take more seriously the, the threat disinformation poses to us. I still remember in 2015 and 2016 when we started talking about these issues. There were still uh, some uh, 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 persons uh, who said that what you are talking about, it's not a problem at all. That you should not do that kind of thing. And there is no such thing as uh, information influencing or disinformation, that you are just imagining these things. And there were some persons and experts who said that the cyber and information domains, they, or cyber and info, they don't, have, they don't have anything to do with each other. But nowadays, when we are spot, talking about uh, deep fakes, etc., it's a good example where technology, cyber and information con connects to each other. So that's important to understand. Mm. And uh, of course, the government communications has followed, and we, uh, as Sweden did their excellent uh, campaign. Uh, we did also campaign in 2000, for example, I think it was our first public awareness raising campaign in 2019 when we, we had parliamentary elections coming. And of course, election interference was one of the things that we were prepared for. And then the question was, how should we communicate and how should we talk with people about this issue? One possibility would have been that we could have start running, running and around screaming that don't believe anything, don't trust anything, election interference, blah, blah, blah. And then we would have ruined our elections by ourselves. Then we look at our elections and uh, the most valuable, the most important thing we needed to protect is the trust. People's trust on our election system, which is very robust. So we launched a campaign uh, it was broadcasted on TV, radio, 
uh, on social media, in billboards, everywhere. And, and the title was that Finland has the best elections in the world. And why is that? Because we are very humble with, with Finns. But the aim of the campaign was to remind people that instead of talking directly disinformation, disinformation, we wanted to remind people that we have been running reliable elections more than 110 years. And the Finnish election system is reliable. We still store the ballots. Every single citizen can go and start counting those hundreds of thousands and millions of ballots years after, uh, after the elections. So that was kind of the key message. Instead of talking about disinformation, the aim was to kind of uh, remind people that even that, that the election system is robust, it's impossible to hack. But what could be hacked is your perception or, or your ideas, thoughts about the election system, which is really, really robust. And I think that's pretty much what we have followed since then. And, and uh, nowadays, now, uh, and I think Finland is a country, uh, Preparing is, is kind of in our uh, DNA. Uh, and when we are talking about how uh, why Finnish society has been so resilient to this information so far, easily tend to start talking about media literacy and media education you mentioned, but I think you need to think about more. You need to look at the whole, whole picture, the whole society. Finns trust exception. The trust uh, on authorities, media, each other is in Finland in, in exceptionally high. It's, 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 it's really high. Over 90% of Finns say, for example, they trust the police and the defense forces. Media, according to Reuters Institute, Finns trust the traditional news media most in the world. And when the pandemic started, and the, the first state of emergency was declared in Finland, it was in May, March 2020, the, statistics, the government statistics agency started conducting a survey regularly, and it, it was called the Citizen's Pulse. The aim of the survey was to kind of uh, measure kind of society's psychological resilience. How people see their situation, are they stressed, do, uh, do they trust uh, authorities, how do they perceive the situation, their future, etc. And it provided us very uh, good information. And for, in the beginning, when the survey was conducted for the first time, uh, it was asked, uh, citizens were asked that where do you get your information regarding COVID-19 and where do you want to get your information? Of course, and I was expecting that the social media would be clearly the, hold the number one position, but boy, boy I was disappointed. Mm. The traditional, traditional three, TV, newspapers, their online versions, radio, were clearly the first three. Social media was somewhere at the bottom of the list. That, that was where the people got, wanted to get their information and where they were getting their information. And then after the traditional news media, was the authorities, friends, et cetera, et cetera, and social media was the bottom of the list. And I think that's, that's, that's good. The, more, the better if people feel, if people trust the society, they trust each other, they feel that the society is treating them equally. They see that their, future, uh, their children has equal possibilities to pursue their virtues, uh, et cetera. So then if they trust the society, the, the more there are polarization, there are uh, people are fighting with each other, the more vulnerable a society becomes. And so far, our society has been very resilient, but there are worrying tendencies, of course, and we should not be thinking about that. That's not a, this information not a problem for us at all, because it would be a huge mistake. Also, thank you. Andrea, Andrea, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is uh, really good, actually, because it's, a, I would say, quite similar in Sweden. Um, each country um, has its own vulnerabilities, however, so it's important to learn about the vulnerabilities. Now, speaking from a defense perspective, I would say two things. One about social media is that we see a changing landscape. We see decentralization, we see users using many different platforms versus 10 years ago, perhaps, uh, we ventured to Facebook and that was it. Now there's so many different platforms that are being used. And this is something that uh, antagonist actors, they know about this, so they target um, users specifically depending on where they are and what platform is regulated, what platform regulates content, what platform doesn't, and how users migrate to other platforms. So there's an entire sort of ecosystem with that and how users use social media now, these days compared to before. We also see when it comes to threat actors, trends, um, they develop during a longer period of time. This was mentioned earlier today, which I thought was really good. 
is that um, threat actors, they tend to be more, uh, they, they try to be more effective by targeting in a sort of more of a narrow way these days. So before, a few years ago, it was bot networks, try to disseminate as much as possible, amplify. These bot networks are quite easy to identify these days. So it's all about uh, not being able to be identified. So it's more targeted. Um, and if these smaller operations, so to speak, information influence operations are identified, then yeah, maybe they haven't had as much success, but the attempt is to just do it more covertly and just target more directly and, 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 and even more targeted than before. Um, we also see, for example, that threat actors use many different platforms themselves, not just social media, but they use blogs, they develop fake news sites, and then they disseminate information in a very coordinated and targeted way from uh, many different types of platforms. So that's, um, as far as trends go, something to mention. And another thing that we see is that we, we refer to as disinformation for hire. So proxies, companies, PR companies, they are basically paid and used to, to, to disseminate this information. And disinformation, that's information that's intended to harm, right? This was also was our first speaker of the conference that said malinformation is separate from misinformation. And we do still um, think about the different ways of how information is used. And disinformation is intended to harm by, in our case, the way we look at it by threat actors is part of a hybrid threat arsenal. Um, so we do not, for example, monitor content. We don't sit and, and Google, for lack of a, a better word, at like disinformation and misinformation. We look at how actors um, actually operate, how they talk to each other, and the infrastructure of how they target a country. Mm. So content is less um, of, of, uh, of what, we, what we use in our identifying and our analyzing and our countering efforts. Um, and what was I going to say? Yes, the disinformation for hire aspect is something that we see quite increasing. Um, and all of the trends that I've mentioned are about uh, not being able to identify the source as easily as it has been before. It's never been easy because that's the whole point of disinformation. It's deceptive, it's hidden, uh, but it does really intend to focus on the vulnerabilities in each country. So it's, it is, um, it's important to know um, and, and, and learn about each country's vulnerabilities as a start. Awesome, well thank you. I think we want to turn it over to the audience. So please, uh, I can see lots of hands. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Marina Dorosh. Uh, I'm from IREX. So I think that I have a um, comment and question. Uh, the comment is related to the defining of success. It was really a great um, discussion. Um, I have been working in media literacy area in Ukraine, I think, for 10 years already. And I see that um, this is one of the biggest challenge to define this desirable and measurable outcome, especially when we're speaking about the audience. What do we want them to do? To identify disinformation, to reduce consumption of disinformation. Especially it's becoming more challenging when some participants of the trainings report that, uh, yes, I'm able to identify disinformation, but I still consume these like bad channels, uh, but they don't influence me. And on this point, I'm thinking about the, uh, actually whether it is success or it's not. And uh, the question, it's related to the um, ethics in interventions uh, in the content um, which uh, aim to counter disinformation whether it is content like a um, game or it is uh, debunking, how do you think whether it is appropriate to use some techniques which we usually criticize when the better actors use, like influence on emotions, manipulating emotions, whether it is appropriate to package like a good content facts in this shape and related the games whether it is ethical actually to uh, ask users to create propaganda. 
Steve? Or? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, great question. The the ethics of interventions. Um, I think. Well, uh, one of the reasons that that I and Sander uh, do a lot of work on inoculation is that we can do this by focusing on teaching people how to spot bad argumentation. Okay, in a nutshell. Um, now, it seems to me that giving people a skill to detect something that is misleading is, is an inherently an ethical thing to do. And, you know, the argumentation has been studied since the old Greeks 2,000 years ago. And things like scapegoating or incoherence um, and a number of other misleading argumentation techniques have been known to be flawed for, you know, I mean, forever. So how could it be wrong to teach people about that? You know, if somebody is contradicting themselves, be careful, they're wrong. I mean, they have to be wrong. The earth cannot be round and flat at the same time. And if somebody is saying that in the same sentence, well, then, you know, that contradiction tells you that there is something problematic about the statement. So I think those interventions, to my mind, are, are uh, ethical. And especially if you're upfront about it and you tell people, hey, you know, this, isn't, this teaches you something. Next question. Hello. Hi. My name is Hudson Golino. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Virginia. I have a question for Andrea and a question for uh, the entire panel. Before asking my question, I would like to say that I used to think that Sander had the best job in the world, professor against the dark arts, until I met Andrea that works in the psychological defense unit. So you probably have the best job in the world, most interesting one. My question is, um, uh, uh, what's the relationship or the similarities between the Swedish Psychological Defense Agency and uh, the group in Estonia that have been working with against disinformation, misinformation manipulation since 2007? So that's my uh, main question. And the second one is, is the Swedish uh, Psychological Defense Agency open to collaborations with uh, scholars from other countries? Mm -hmm. And the question or the call for the, the entire panel is, well, uh, Russia spends hundreds of millions of dollars for manipulation and disinformation campaigns. The funding agencies, at least in the United States, they don't spend even a fraction of that to invest in research in this area. Disinformation is a complex problem in an ever-changing world that requires multidisciplinarity in a complex system-based approach. But we know that funding such type of research is very difficult and almost impossible. Uh, is there any way that we here, everybody together, can help improve lines of funding for this multidisciplinary, complex-based system approach to address this information? Thank you. Andrea, I'll have you yes, start. Yes, I'll answer your, your last question to me um, first about uh, research um, and funding. Um, the uh, Swedish Psychological Defense Agency, 10% of our funding supports research. And we also support, at the moment, we started uh, in, at Lund University um, a, um, an institute for psychological defense, and it's headed by James Pament. And so um, if uh, anyone, as far as research goes, would be interested and ha has a project, then it's, um, I would advise also to contact James. Um, we have a certain internal process at the agency where we um, look at areas of where we can fund research and so on. It's not on my desk, so I'm not, it's not my day, day job, but um, we do support research, I can say that. And when it comes to Estonia, uh, we actually, we're in close collaboration with the government and civil society in Estonia, and we have at um, from September, we will have a secondant from our um, agency there. So that tells you a lot about how closely we will collaborate. Thank you. Brahm, you want to talk about funding? Uh, is there enough money to do this, right? Uh, buying, buying up people to be more accurate would be 
Sanders wet dream. So that 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 would be something <laughs> that that we could could find. No, here's 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 the basic problem. I think that there's enough money to go around, but the money right now is. Uh, it's not just outspending Russia in counter propaganda. That's that's not what we're going for. But the the focus now of most of the funding that is spread worldwide, and we then we include Philippines and Taiwan and all the efforts we've done worldwide. Um, I think it's, there's still a ton of money going to the wrong things, like uh, fact checking, uh, instead of stuff that actually works. Uh, or even trying out new stuff, like uh, uh, pointing out what uh, the meta study yesterday confirmed, what Steve just brought up, that most uh, we have to point at the alt-right actually abusing the system more than, it's not both sideism. We have to come clear with who's, who's actually doing the problem. We, we don't say threat actors, just say Russia. Point to ERG, be upfront, uh, upfront about it. We were pushy footing our way around the stuff, and a lot of money flows away to hand holding and conferences. Sorry, this one <laughs> excluded, of course. <laughs> but talking about it instead of doing something about it. And that is, that is actually, if we could redirect the funding just to alleviate the problem, that would be something. So, my guess would be there's enough money floating around, but we scare a lot of donors away because we're put, pushy footing about the accountability, about uh, the, des, uh, the, the definitional problem and stuff like that. And we should talk less and do more. I just want to address the, the oh, sorry, defense against the dark arts misperception that uh, that, that, that is, a, is a good job. At least in the novels, they seem to perish quite quickly after having attained that role. So, you know, i <laughs> still kicking for now. But just, uh, Hudson, just so you know that uh, it's supposed to be a cursed role, I think. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Caroline Zima. Um, I'm from the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena. Uh, first, thank you so much for this great panel. It was super interesting, but also very entertaining. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I have a question mostly for Andrea and Yussi, because, um, well, yesterday I think um, we learned a lot about the importance of addressing different communities and also um, uh, connecting with community leaders in order to um, make communities less vulnerable to disinformation. I was wondering if you can talk a bit more about um, the strategic communication efforts that you do in your countries and whether you always try to address uh, the society as a whole, or whether you also target your communication campaigns to uh, specific communities. Thank you. Target. No, if I, if I start, uh, our camp. We are always uh, a good example is what we did during the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, we had nationwide campaigns, but then certain groups in our society then they are more vulnerable to disinformation than others. And of course, we, we had nationwide campaigns, but then we, we, we collaborated, for example, with NGOs, because they meet, uh, uh, they meet, for example, people who are in vulnerable positions. Of course, how much I would like that uh, every single people would follow government web pages every Friday and push F5 and refresh the website and look what kind of, what kind of press releases the government has published, but it's, the business is not so. Uh, we are doing quite a lot of thinking about how, how should we reach different audiences because the, our adversaries are doing exactly the same. And if we think that we, there is just only one message we need to communicate and that's enough, uh, so we will lose, uh, lose the game. And for example, a good example was during the COVID-19 pandemic was that, uh, that uh, our health authority, Finnish Institute uh, for Health and Welfare, uh, so for example, they launched a campaign in Tinder and that uh, it was a, va a vaccination campaign, and the title of the campaign was uh, Have You Already Got Twice? And I think that that's a good example, that we ne always need to look our audiences, and of course we need to look our messages. And there are, there are many, <laughs> Finland, many other, other countries are multicultural, so uh, there are a lot of people whose lang major language is uh, not Finnish. 
for example. Then, and they, there could be in small communities that they don't trust the authorities. Then the messen it's better that the messenger is someone else than the authority. And then the government, we need to collaborate, for example, NGOs who are working with these um, uh, minority groups, for example, and find, the, uh, find, the, find ways to disseminate information. And that's, that's our, our duty to do it. Yeah, I can add to this, this is also quite similar, but, yeah. but um, uh, I have colleagues that work on national but also regional and local levels all, all the way down to munic municipal level where they, um, in this capacity building effort that I was talking about, they go out and they meet with people in society on many different, in many different groups where, when they, where they share the information that we can share uh, about knowing and understanding disinformation and so on, and about how to, um, uh, our efforts to build resilience and the will to fight and so on and so against this. Um, on the, uh, I can mention uh, the um, information influence, uh, the malign information influence campaign directed towards Sweden that started last year in um, January, somewhere there, I can start there, by Islamist actors online. And this resulted in the end um, to um, demonstrations in the streets in Sweden. And it, it was um, also picked up by state media in the Middle East, Al Jazeera, for example. So it spread like wildfire. And it's usually what happens. Once things really get going online, it gets going also offline. And um, we really had to give it a real think of what to do here because the targets were the minorities and the Arabic-speaking Muslim communities that were really truthfully afraid. Um, and um, the narratives that were, were being shared was what, what you may mentioned before, maybe when you and I spoke earlier, was that um, Muslim children are kidnapped from Muslim families and they're placed in foster homes where they're forced to be secularized. So they have to start eating pork and they're also placed with pedophiles. So sexual exploitation, human trafficking, those types of narratives. And this, uh, what we recognized was very sensitive on specifically local levels, of course, not just the minority, but also decision-making at local levels. And the target was the Swedish social services. And so what we did with all of that knowledge, the operational knowledge that we gather, threat actors, vulnerabilities, and we put it all together, we have situational pictures that we provide, we, we gave it to the social services, and then they use all of their knowledge that they have with all of, um, all of the field workers that they also implement all of that, what we could give them into the system. And uh, we met with them about a year later, um, including field workers that were talking about how, how it was really helpful to them in being, being able to use this type of information that then they could give to people that were truthfully scared. So, and you may have also heard about the Quran burnings in Sweden. So um, the malign information influence campaign peaked last year, and then it sort of has been going in waves. It dips and goes up and down. But with the Quran burning, it's given it new fuel. And we can see that it's pretty much the same actors out there that are targeting Sweden. And we are in, a, in quite a difficult situation when it comes to Sweden's support to Ukraine, for example, the NATO application, so it coincides also with um, the security situation in Europe and with, with Sweden's... It, the image of Sweden is being completely uh, haunted down and, and, and these actors are trying to point out Western um, sort of Islamophobia and using Sweden as an example, how Sweden discriminates against Muslim because of their religion. So this is something then that we also have pointed out to the Swedish social services, and they have created a lot of content in Arabic so that it can reach the people that really need to be reached. And uh, what we also recognized was that very simple messaging in Sweden, we're talking like super simple, so that people that uh, do not speak Swedish in their everyday life, that they can, and, and, and these Swedish messages have also been really helpful. So this, this, this is just an example of how we, we, um, how we work. You see on it. And I would like to add that, uh, and one, a second example I would like to mention was that uh, in certain cities in Finland during the pandemic, uh, someone had printed on 
uh, printed leaflets which resembled or the layout looked exactly the same as the Finnish health authorities uh, visual identity looks like. And it, it, the leaflet uh, contained uh, corona disinformation. And someone had distributed that put into people's mailboxes, especially elderly homes. Mm. And the particular city's uh, communication director and the director of health affairs contacted us and asked that what should they do. And when, when we discussed with them, and, and I must admit that they had done exactly the right thing, they had uh, started to discuss with social workers, field workers, and while they were busy, because if you think of an uh, elderly person, and you hear that a male, a male has arrived, and then you go, and then you see a leaflet which looks like authorities, uh, published by an authority, but it contains corona disease. Don't take vaccine, don't wear face mask, blah, blah, blah. But then they had done exactly the same, that while those field workers and social workers uh, were visiting uh, those elderly uh, residents in elderly homes, so they started discussing about these issues. And uh, I think that was the right, right way, way to do it. And also in the beginning of the corona pandemic, we collaborated for, we, with social media influencers, and that even made in he headlines uh, internationally. Political made a news story how Finnish government is collaborating with social media influencers. Mm. And, uh, we, we shared uh, authorities' information to them, and they were free to distribute it as they wanted. And that was, again, uh, we want because we wanted to reach uh, different uh, audiences, and government press release is not always the best one, <laughs> best product, or sending faxes, yeah. if someone is using it. Thank you. I think we have time for at least one more. Let's try one more. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Yeah. So hi, my name is Catherine. I am from Logically. We're an organization that does fact-checking for social media platforms. I know we're not the only one that's here. Um, we also do OSINT work and identify coordinated inauthentic behavior. This has been a fascinating panel, so I really appreciate hearing what you're saying. But I have an edge case I would like to pose to you, because I think it's one that many people in this room would be familiar with. And I'm curious what our reasoning is for explain I'm curious how we explain this one okay so flat earthers yeah okay so hear me out hear me out it's been pre-bunked we all went to school <laughs> it's been debunked it's been fact-checked it it's been disproven <laughs> what what is happening there because I don't think it's the only instance like it, but I do think it shows that there's a lot more going on there than simply misunderstanding. It's not your mom sharing a post that's just a little off. So what's happening there? Because I think that it's a good edge case to consider how this stuff proliferates. This is exactly what Steve will... Yeah, thanks so much for asking that question. Because We've planted her, right? <laughs> but the yeah, yeah. You but again, no one has paid me anything, so I couldn't pay her. Um, the, um, this brings me back to the first point I made about the architecture of social media. And this is, to my mind, a completely underappreciated and under-researched phenomenon. Now, one of the things that makes the internet and social media qualitatively different from any other form of human communication we've ever had is the fact that uh, epistemic communities can form online around any proposition, no matter how absurd. Amen. Now, um, if you think back to the 19th century, and if supposing you're the proverbial village idiot in Gloucestershire somewhere, and sorry, I don't want to insult Gloucestershire, just anywhere, <laughs> and you think the earth is flat. Now, no one else around you would have believed that. No one else in your life that you would have met would have ever believed that. You would, you would have been completely isolated in that outlandish belief. Now you go on Facebook and you type in flat earth and bang, there is your epistemic community within seconds. Now, one consequence of that is that you as the <coughs> holder of this belief have a sense of a widespread consensus. You have an epistemic community. You think a lot of other people share that belief. And the moment you do that, we know from a lot of psychological research that it becomes much, much harder for you to dislodge that belief. 
People hold a belief in proportion to the strength of the perceived consensus around them, as a rule of thumb, more or less. Now, the flat earthers are a perfect example because they now have a community online. They're, they're you know, spread all over the place, and it's only one in a million or one in two million Facebook users, but that doesn't mean they don't have a thousand or a few hundred online that share the belief. And the moment you have that, it becomes entrenched. And the moment you, you, you have a community, it becomes possible for them to dismiss all external effort at debunking as being part of the conspiracy. And that, I think, is a unique aspect of the internet that it is sending completely distorted signals about the prevalence of a belief. And that is something we didn't have previously. And I think uh, that's underappreciated and under-researched, but I think that's the reason why these beliefs persist. Just to add to Steve's explanation, which I would also fully endorse that it's a, a social, relational motive for, for people. And the people who endorse Flat Earth, that's typically not the only belief that they endorse. They tend to, they tend to also have other, quote unquote, funny conspiracies uh, about, about the world uh, that are all linked together in, in, in some way. But also, I, I would come back to the, the more mundane cognitive question, explanation. Be honest with yourself. How many people in this room can tell me right now why the Earth is not flat? What's the physical mechanism? Oh. Oh. Wow. Right? And this is, this is I'm not making fun of, of, of anyone. <coughs> this is the fact about pre-bunking, is that in the moment, people don't have the right mental defenses to counter-argue uh, arguments that seem persuasive. Um, and I think that's what people sometimes misunderstand about the value of, of having that. I do think people endorse Flat Earth for social reasons and other reasons, but when you come to Flat Earth anti-vax, a lot of the same techniques are used on people. You take something that actually requires knowing about something uh, and surprise people with some explanation that seems insane, but then when you ask people to explain it, they often don't know and start doubting their own beliefs. Um, and so that, I think, is, 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 is you know, a small part of the answer. I can just contribute briefly to this. Um, and flat earth is, to me, perhaps not like, sort of the most difficult thing to understand what's sort of round and what's flat and so on. But usually when we at the agency, when we approach matters out there, so to speak, we recognize that people don't understand how things work. They, for example, so this is an excellent point. So that's point. the thing. Yeah, that's, they that's don't, his point. They yeah. don't know how a law works. They don't, but they may be, th what we've recognized, for example, in conjunction with this malign information influence campaign is our freedom of speech has been pitched against burning the Koran. But people, if you ask, and this is not because someone is, is stupid, maybe when it comes to flat earth, yes, but in many cases, most cases, it's like, if exactly describing what freedom of speech and the law behind it, what it actually constitutes, people don't know. So that's sort of what we bring with us, that not only do we go out and describe how actors um, are targeting us, we describe, we can't talk about our vulnerabilities, but we describe precisely how things work, and then we hand it over to people, journalists, for example, they're excellent researchers, they're really good at describing how a law works, and how things actually, how, how, um, how society works, because that's often a lack. There is sort of a, a gap. A couple of years uh, on social media started circulating a conspiracy theory that Finland, is a, uh, it, Finland doesn't exist. It's a conspiracy theory created by yeah, Sweden. It, yeah, yeah. Because of fishing rights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and someone, someone even asked me that, have you seen me. that now there is, there is a story spreading that Finland doesn't exist. I don't know where I am. It was in Helsinki. And, but uh, that's a more yeah, joke, a but it was just funny. Yeah. So I also said it about Australia, so we don't know how you got here, Steve. But uh, New Zealand is that. It's New Zealand. Oh, it's New yeah, Zealand. It's, it's, that's pretty fake news. Even yeah, on the right. map. They only have one vowel in New Zealand. The one, yeah, so. go ahead. One thing. We run it. Go ahead, Bram. You want to? Uh, recommendation for a book called How Minds Change, David McRaney. Yeah. Uh, brilliant podcast, uh, You Are Not So Smart, is my go-to things for when I don't have a Sander or Steve to dementor. Um, 
that's a great book. It's, uh, it also mentions uh, Charlie Veach. Uh, it's truth or ism, uh, the, the 9-11 uh, conspiracy theories stuff. It's brilliant. Uh, it, it shows him going from the information deficit model that you probably 80% of you still have, that you think that the more facts you throw in to the person that the more they will change their minds, which Steve has told you 30 years not to believe, and the social truth model, which is more like uh, we believe whatever reasons are for social consumption and has nothing to do with uh, thinking straight. Well, thank you. Thank you all for, for joining us. So please thank join you, me in, in thanking you. Your summary. I, I, I also want to have Alan come up because I, I, he, he deserves a, a, another round of applause for this fantastic presentation. <laughs>